Okay. So I list all the various jobs that we have in the league. I think it's important to point out here, you know, some of you I know have worked table, some of you have worked as an announcer. Um, but if you're here new as a, as a judge, I'm pretty sure you haven't done that. You haven't been a referee, but it's worth pointing out uh, with the referee there, that person is the head official. You as a judge, you're gonna be part of a three to five judge panel. Hopefully you have enough folks there of the parent volunteers to do this. Um, if not, the coaches would be, it would be okay to have the coaches serve as judges, but you want that to be the last resort. You're probably better off having a situation that either you have five judges or you have three. Um, you're better served to go ahead and, and have the, the coaches go ahead and do their job and not have them worry about serving as a judge. But who knows, sometimes the circumstance uh, dictates that. But I can tell you in all the years that I've been serving on a panel, either as a judge or a referee, I've yet to run into a problem where we didn't have enough judges. We found a way to make it happen. On a rare occasion, do we go ahead and put a coach in the chair? But that's hopefully enough of you folks. And I'd like to think there's going to be more than enough because there's, with this group tonight, we're going to have well over 200 of you judges that are completely certified for this season. So that helps. Um, so how do you become a dive judge? Oh, boy, there could be a whole lot of reasons why you're here. Um, word of mouth, you know, maybe it's just your interest. Uh, maybe you, you, were, you were voluntold to be here. I'm not sure. Um, could be any number of reasons. But point being here is that you don't have to really know anything coming in. You don't have any special prerequisites, although I'm hopeful that some of you had a chance to look at the current handbook and look at the pages in there that have to do with, um, with you serving as a judge. That's very helpful, especially in our discussion tonight. But no, you don't need any special training coming in, but that's why you're here. I'm giving you a little bit of a special training, just kind of give you the layout of the tools that you're going to need to be a, a, you know, an effective judge in our league. And really what it comes down to is just you got to have that willingness to understand the rules, you know, and, and understand the methods of becoming fair, consistent, and effective judge on individual dives. You're not judging a whole team. You're not judging, you know, the whole group as a whole. You're not judging whoever the diver is. The only thing your focus is going to be when it comes down to it, you're judging an individual dive. You're not going to care who it is. That's not going to make any difference. What it's going to boil down to, you're judging that dive. It doesn't matter who it is. You're going to hear a dive. You're going to know what the dive is, and that's how you're going to evaluate it. Okay. I put it in here, you know, experience as a judge. That may have to do with if you're if you judge before in a different league or something like that. But of course, it's not mandatory. We'll get you the tools here tonight. You'll be fine. Okay. So the basics, your responsibilities. Um, as I mentioned, the MCDL handbook, if you don't have a hard copy of that, that's okay. The PDF copy is on the website, uh, on mcdiving.org. Uh, it's free, no cost. It's not the, you know, it's not a New York Times uh, bestseller, but it's got, you know, some decent information in there that'll be quite useful to you. It's got records and things like that and some other, other good things in there, um, certainly has pages in there about what the referee's responsibilities are. But for you all, pages 15 to 22, uh, pages 32 to 37, that's, that basically lays out where you are as a judge and what you need to look for. It talk a little bit more in depth about um, what, what the, uh, all the parts of the dive are that you're looking for. I also put in here after our first session that we did, pages 45 to 48, those actually have the silhouettes in the book that give you a, you know, a, a black and white illustration, if you will, uh, of, of how our basic dives are and what, what it should be looking, through, uh, looking for through the dives. I got a few of those to look at here tonight. Um, so again, on the list, you, you need to be fair and impartial at all times, as long as you have the willingness to do that. And as I mentioned, you're always going to judge the dive, not the diver. You're not going to care who that person is. 
And you're, you're going to call it like you see it. You as a judge, you're going to make your call and you're going to stick with it. It doesn't matter. You, you can, we can talk about if you need to make adjustments and so forth, but nobody's going to tell you that you need to make adjustments. Those are things you're going to be doing within yourselves. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. So as part of a judging panel, your job is just to evaluate that dive at that moment. That's all that matters, your focus. There's gonna be a lot of dives you're gonna be seeing. Your focus is gonna be on looking at that dive, evaluate it, give a score and move on. That's basically what it is. A lot of things are gonna happen rather quickly. Um, some might think it's happening too fast or whatever, but believe me, you, if you have the tools and you know what to look for, you'll be able to evaluate dives rather quickly and, and effectively. And over time, you know, it'll, it'll really become second nature for you. So you'll be fine. Um, and, he, and as you go along, especially all the new folks, I can tell you right from the get go, you can expect to mess up. I mess up a, 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 a good handful of times even as having all the experience I have in judging and, and many different levels, um, it happens, but that's okay. That's the beauty of having a five judge panel because if your score is low off from the others, it doesn't matter because a high score and a low score are gonna get knocked out. And then whatever that mean value is gonna be is what's gonna be that raw score is what's gonna get moved on and computed for the divers. So you make a mistake, not a big deal. It's all part of it, it's human. Um, so here's what it comes down to. Okay. So for your part here as a judge, this is what the dive is made up of. Okay. The dive is constructed of four basic elements that structure the dive. Uh, each part is scored equally. Okay. Regardless of what, the, you know, what direction the dive is starting in. Um, so the four parts we look for here might be a little bit different some, than some other leagues and so forth. You're looking at the approach, you're looking at a takeoff, the flight through the air, and the entry. Those are the four elements. That's, that's what you're going to be looking at. And we'll talk about what those are and what to look for in detail there in just a moment. So again, these elements are all considered when judging. So when you're scoring that overall uh, quality of the dive or you know, its proper form and grace, you're looking, you're looking to include all of those elements to the best of your ability. And I say that also because some of you may feel like you're not quite getting it, but you will. I promise you that. But it'll just take a little bit of time. Okay, so here, here, here's the breakdown of the parts. Okay, just to explain it for you. Okay, so the first part, of the dive is always going to be the approach. Okay. Um, it is worth noting when a diver is getting up on the board, and I know a lot of you have seen this, they may be walking around and all that. We're not even concerned about anything that's going on until a diver gets set into whatever position it is. They may be doing uh, uh, wherever they are on the board. If they've established a set position, that's when we're going to start talking about where you come in as a judge. That's when you start looking and focusing and so forth. So any movements are going on to get to that starting position, you're not worried about. They may be having a conversation with a coach or whatever it may be, and that's fine. But once they know we have it started, then we can talk about it, okay? Now, for the approach, the starting position on standing dives, it's gonna be on the front end of the diving board. The body, which you assume to be, uh, the body should be straight, the head up, looking forward, or in the case they're doing a back dive or an inward, they're gonna have their head up, looking forward, focused, okay? The head is up, it's erect, should be looking in whatever, whatever direction that they're starting to dive in. The arms, they could be wherever they may be, they could have them up or whatever, but typically if they're standing on the end of the board, they may have their arms down on their side. They may have them up front if they're doing a forward approach, even on the back, uh, the, the back approach or whatever, you know, they could be reaching or whatever, as long as they establish that start position before they start uh, moving their arms around, they have to show a start position, okay? Um, so again, those arms could be in any position they want, okay? Now for the other starting position, which could be a forward approach or for running dives. That's where they're 
back near the stand somewhere, or they may be, maybe they're halfway down the board, but they're not on the end of the board. They're going to be uh, incorporating um, a few steps, and then that's going to go into what's called a hurdle. But the point is, is that their, their approach is going to begin once they've set, and then they start their, their motion. That's going to be the start of the approach. Or if they're standing on the end of the board, they set and they start an oscillation process. Okay, that's part of their, you know, a back dive or an inward dive. That's actually part of an approach of how they're approaching to do their, their uh, final press and off the board. Uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but for that forward approach or running dives, so whenever that diver has set, um, once they attempt that first step, that's what actually begins the approach. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. Now, the takeoff is the next part of the, the dive. You have the approach, and then the takeoff is where you have, uh, where they're going to go from the approach, and the takeoff is going to be to a hurdle. Now, the hurdle is where they're going to be coming down the board. They're going to be doing at least one step. Maybe they're doing two, three, or four steps, and then they're going to be doing one of two types of hurdles. Now, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit of detail about that, but the point is that they're going to be doing their steps, and then they're going to be pressing up. They're going to be coming up on one foot, one foot off the hurdle, and then they're going to be coming down on the end of the board with both feet, which will be that final press. And that's where they're going to be taken off into the air off the end of the board. So uh, there's different, there's a couple different hurdles that happen in this league. Um, there is the two, three, four, five step, and then a hurdle, which is typically what you're going to see uh, with all the beginning divers and some of many of the divers, even with those with the experience will do that. But there's also uh, what's called a hop hurdle, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit when the videos come in. A lot of the uh, older experienced divers do that. So I'll, I'll bring that up when we start talking about deficiencies in a dive and so forth. But what it boils down to for that second part of this dive on the takeoff, the diver has to show and has to do it very smooth. Got to show that they have good confidence and that it's forceful and it's controlled. I bookend this when I write this and say it's it's got to be smooth and controlled. Everything there in between, being forceful and being confident and what they're doing with the dive is all inclusive to that. So when they're, they're doing their approach, they should show that they mean business, that they are focused, that they are ready to perform this dive accordingly, okay? So there's the first two parts. You've got your approach, you've got your takeoff. Now, Go to the next part. Now, flight through the air, the third part. Now, this is where the position of the dives come into play here. There are three positions that you're going to be seeing in the various dives throughout uh, the season. So the three positions are, there's the straight position, there is the pipe position that's bent at the waist or the hips. Um, the tuck position is where they're gonna be bending at the knees and the hips. And then the fourth one, a free position, which technically is not a position, it's actually a combination of the three. And it can have one, two, or three. Uh, it's gonna have at least one of those in there when we talk about a free position. Um, but we'll, we'll talk in detail about how that comes into play as well. But that's the flight. That's everything that's gonna be happening upstairs, if you will. What's gonna be up, out, away from the board, not too far out from the board, but all the activity goes up in the air. That's where you're going to see so all the neat stuff, how they perform, you know, whatever spins or rotations or whatever it may be. Um, but that that will include whatever position the body is going to be designated, what it's going to be announced to be doing. So the body positions, a good time to jump in here and talk a little bit about those body positions. As I mentioned, these silhouettes are in the handbook. Um, on the on the website, if you just want to pull it up directly or read it wherever you want to. So <clears throat> the silhouettes, again, they're on pages 45 and through 48 um, in the handbook. Um, straight position. Basically, like you see it here, okay, the body is not bent at the hips or the knees. The back could be arched slightly. That's okay. That's part of, you know, some of the aesthetics and the grace 
of, of and style that the diver may be displaying with this, and that's great stuff. Um, but the point is, they're not bending. They're not bending back this way. You know, they can arch their back as they're going. So you see that in part four of this silhouette here, where he's got his, you know, he's got his back arched. He's even doing that in three and four, and then and then even with uh, five and six there, but then straightens up to go in. But the point is, is that the feet are together, the toes are pointed. It, you know, it's a straight line. That's what the body position is supposed to be when it's calling for a straight position. So. The next position is the pike position. Um, this is where they're bending at the hips or the waistline, if you will, but the knees are locked straight. They should be straight at all times. The legs ought to be together. They should be together, hopefully, you know, that, that happens. Toes pointed. That's part of what the pike position should. Now, if you look at this silhouette here, what, what this illustration shows is diver where he's coming down, basically doing a toe touch. And that's fine too. There are some divers that are able to go ahead and bring it all the way up and that's great. But I think in this league, you're gonna see a lot of these kids where they're just gonna kind of do this quick thing where they're just gonna be snapping their pikes very quickly. And their, their hands aren't really gonna be doing much of a motion towards it or anything, but um, that is by definition what a pike is supposed to be. Clearly bent at the waist, at the hips, and the legs are staying straight and toes pointed. Now, tuck position. This is where the body is bent at the hips and the knees, okay? What you should be seeing, uh, close to it at least, is what this, this silhouette is showing here, where this diver is doing, where he's, he's coming in and doing a nice, compact tuck where the knees are coming right up against the body. He's even got the hands behind the legs to pull himself tight. You notice that the toes are pointed. You can't really tell that the legs are together, but take my word, that's what's supposed to be. They need to get their legs as close together as possible. I know some of you have seen in the Olympics. In fact, I was just looking at some of those videos this morning that the international divers get away with having their knees apart you know, when they're doing a tuck because they're trying to get all that spin and all that. Well, technically speaking, they're not supposed to be doing that. Well, they're not supposed to be doing it here in the youth league. They need to be able to keep their tucks as close and tight and compact as possible. They want to go doing that on a higher level somewhere else. That's their business. But here we're supposed to have them doing a nice, neat, compact tuck. That's what they should be doing. Okay. Now, free. Free position, if you will. Um, this is these are used not only in the twisting dives. This is also designated for um, the lineups that we're going to talk about and the jumps that we are also going to be talking about. So you see a listing. If you hear free position, you'll know. Other than twisting dives, those are the other ones you may see those in. Okay. So again. What does it mean? With the twisting dives, the free position call on a twisting dive, it incorporates any or all or any of or all three position. Um, it could be a couple of them. It can be a combination of straight and pike, which is usually what you're going to see. There are some specific uh, twisting dives that only allow the tuck. Uh, there's like four or five different dives that allow that, but generally speaking, the tuck isn't even allowed in the twisting dives unless it's absolutely designated. And for those that it isn't designated, uh, we have those listed as uh, the ones they can do. But generally speaking, when you see a twisting dive, it's gonna be that combination of the pike and the straight or just one or the other. Um, but generally speaking, you're gonna see those. And this being here, where you have a 5132 here, this is uh, a one and one half somersault. And this diver is doing a full twist. And I think I've got a video just to show you that, um, you know, how that, how that actually gets performed. Um, so the last part of, of the evaluation here for you as a judge is the entry. So this is part four. Of, of the dive, okay? So when they're going into the water, we're always hopeful that the divers get all their, 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 their twisting somersault, whatever they're doing is everything's up in the air. 
And in the ideal world, they're going to be coming down. They're going to come in. They're going to straighten up. Now, they're either coming in head first or they're coming in feet first. Regardless of the position, they should be going in as vertical as possible. You're always hoping for that. They want to be nice and straight line coming into the water. And they're not leaning too far forward. They're not too far back. Those are little things that you as a judge can look for. We can talk about that. But essentially what the, the, the excellent dive, it ought to be going in as straight as possible. So, and then also when they go in, their entry from the end of the board should be no more than three or four feet. That's what I like to call the sweet spot. Okay, if they're going out too far, that's a problem. If they're going in too close, they're creating a safety issue and that's not good either. So when they're doing any of these dives, no matter what we're talking about, that three to four foot range is really what you as a judge should be looking for where they ought to be entering into the water. And of course, any of those divers that can go ahead and they can kind of rip the water, you know, do what they call the rip entry, and they have like little or no splash, that's, that's great stuff. But again, that's only part of what you're looking for. You need to pay attention to everything else that goes on before that, before they go in. Many, many dives are gonna have a variant of you know, great entry and not so great twisting or flight. They may have screwed up their approach somehow. You know, their takeoff could be flawed. We'll talk about that, okay? So what's important on the entry here, on the head first, they need to make sure their arms are stretched out well over the head. They can have it in the wish position if they want. They can just have it with their hands just pointed straight ahead and flat. That's fine. As long as they've got it well above their head. Okay, that's on a head first entry. Feet first entry, and I mentioned about jumps. The arms need to be down. They need to be down close to the body. They should be lined up nice and straight. That's what you should be looking for. Their arms should not be out here somewhere, okay? They don't need to be flailing out somewhere. What you as a judge are expecting to see when they're going feet first, those arms are down. That's what you wanna see. The only exception to that is gonna be if they're doing a jump, the jump positions, as many of you may be familiar with, whether they're doing a front jump or a back jump, their arms could be up if they want, if they're going into the water. But the thing is, Aesthetically pleasing, it's either the arms are up or the arms are down. So it doesn't matter. But again, if they're somewhere over here and they got their arms in the wrong position, that's where you come in as a judge and you can call that into question. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. Now, I wanted to show you this. The young lady is actually performing that twisting dive I mentioned. Just so you see all the elements, you don't have to judge this thing here, but you get an idea of what encompasses a complete dive. Now, kind of cheated on this video a little bit because she's already started her approach, but the point being here is you're gonna see her approach, you're gonna see her incorporate this approach, and at the end of that approach, she's going to incorporate that hurdle where she's gonna press off of one foot, take herself up enough to come back down on the end of the board on two feet, and then do her, her takeoff, her, after, after she does her takeoff and she does her final press, she's doing her flight through the air and, and then she should be doing her one and a half somersault and a whole twist. So what it means is that she's up in this position, she's gonna go ahead and rotate once and then another half rotation. So she's gonna be doing that and she's gonna twist her body a whole, a whole 360, right? and then go in as vertical as possible. The question for you as a judge, you knowing if what these elements are, you can kind of see if how I just described all these different things, what it's supposed to be, what you think it looks like. So we'll just run this real quick. You don't have to judge this now, but it's just something for you to look at. I'm gonna to try to run that one more time because that looked like it, it kind of chopped up a little bit. So let me try that one more time for you all. It may not come through very well because I've got this running through this PowerPoint, but the other dives I have will be a little better. Okay, so it was kind of hard to tell there, but she did incorporate all the, all the parts of the dive there. 
so she she was just finishing up her approach she did she did her take off of the hurdle she did her press down the end of the board okay then she began her flight she certainly did her one and a half and then she did her full twist and she came in you know call it fairly straight what have you but okay not perfect but those are just kind of example of what you may be looking at okay so the different types of dives that you're going to be looking at okay so we've got these all grouped up in the numbers here there's going to be what direction the dive starts at so that they have the front dive which all divers are going to be starting with are either going to be doing a front dive or a lineup we'll talk about lineups in a bit but all of those are part of the required dives and especially with the eight and unders even they all have to do some kind of a front dive or a front lineup um and then there are the back dives again, the back dives where they're going to be start, starting at the end of the board. There is no running approach to any of the back dives. They're going to be starting on the front end of the board. Reverse dives, that could be either one. That could either be a, a running or technically they could do a standing approach, but I haven't seen anybody pull off a decent reverse when they're doing a standing approach. It's darn near impossible. Um, some people like to try it, but it doesn't end up turning out very well. So you can always expect reverse dives are always going to have some kind of a, a running approach. At least you're going to see that in the videos we have here tonight. Inward, again, that's also like the back dive. They're going to be starting on the end of the board. They're going to be facing back towards the stands. And that's where they're going to be starting. They start stationary. They're going to start oscillating the board and so forth. And then they'll do their takeoff. The difference between back dive when they're standing on the end and they dive backwards the inward is that they're they're going up and then they're they're coming back forward it's like they're doing a front dive in reverse and that's what defines an inward so the twisting dives those are the five thousands the number is there the added number there is to specify not only how many I mean, how many half somersaults a diver is doing it also incorporates the last number it tells us how many half how many half twists the diver may be doing. We'll talk about that also. Um, we'll do that right here real quick. Um, dive number explanations on page 15 of the book. Um, I think it's good for the judges to, you know, not when you hear the dives, you're going to be hearing the dive numbers because that's what's going to take precedent in this league. Um, the description hopefully matches. It's not required, but we would like to make sure that when they announce a dive to you, you're all hearing that. And because I know the Carol McKay, McHales of the world will make sure that that dive number is announced in the description is exactly as it's supposed to be. I know that because I've worked with her. She's good at it. So when the announcer goes ahead and says, okay, we got a 103C, going to be saying, okay, this what, what direction are they going? That's a forward. So the three here indicates how many half rotations, meaning you got three half rotations, that's a one and one half somersault, meaning they start here, they're gonna rotate one, one more, and they're gonna be going in head first. The position is what we talked about. C uh, actually uh, stands for the tuck position. So this number is indicating a one and one half somersault, tuck position, okay? Now, the dive number for this one for the twisting, the added number was the 5,000. Again, the, the number one here after the five indicates, okay, that's a forward. That's the one position or the one direction, if you will. Those are forwards. Then the third number there is how many uh, half rotations. So that indicates that it's going to be one somersault. And then the last number is indicating how many half twists. So that ends up being a full twist in this case. So we have a, this is a 5122D, D being the position, free position, if you will. So this is a forward, forward, one somersault, one twist. Okay. So they're going to do one somersault and they're going to twist around. So they're starting this way. They're going to do a somersault. They're going to do a full twist and they're still going to be going in feet first. Okay. Don't get too hung up on it, but it's worth taking a look in the book and just familiarize yourself because that'll help you as a judge. So you, at least you hear the number, you can go ahead and start automating and you know what that dive is gonna start looking like, regardless of how it is explained to you. 
Okay, now talk a little bit about those lineups that I mentioned. The lineup, the forward lineup, the 001, and the back lineup 002, they can replace the forward dive or the back dive respectively. Any diver at any, any uh, event, any age group can use the lineup in lieu of doing a dive. We allow that in this league. The difference is that um, the, the degree of difficulty is a little bit lower. But the other point to make about the lineups is that this is a skill. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is. But that's basically they're standing on the end of the board. There is no running approach to a lineup. They're going to be standing on the end of the board and they're going to fall in. There's no press. You as a judge, you're not going to see any kind of press on the board at all. Same for a front, same for a back. That's all it is. It's a skill that they work on. It's about form. It's about control. It's about being able to be able, you know, do that, do that skill as well as possible. We'll, we'll touch on that a bit. Jumps. Um, they consider those the, uh, the, the, the easiest uh, to do um, because, you know, it's really just, you know, the divers or whether they're doing a running approach or a standing approach on the forward they simply do all those elements of the dive, but they're coming up and there is no rotations. That's why it's a, a 100. There are zero rotations there. So they're coming to the end of the board, they're coming up in the air, and they're coming in straight with the legs together, feet together, toes pointed, all that fun stuff. That's what a jump is. They either do a front jump, a back jump, always on the end of the board, just like doing a back dive. You're lining up at the end of the board. They start oscillating the board, and they go up into the air, get some good height, and come in nice and straight, legs together. And again, for jumps, the arms could be up or down or whatever. They shouldn't be out to the side somewhere. They should be having good form. Um, you know, it's been said that because the, the jump is so easy, um, the, the, the mistake that past judges have made is that they felt like, well, it's not a very difficult thing, so I'm not going to give it a great score. You know, there's nothing wrong with giving a jump a 10 if it's that perfect. You know, you may decide that, and that's okay. Um, it does happen. There are divers who do just absolutely pristine jumps. I've seen it. Um, they weren't quite awarded a 10, but they certainly got up there, the eight and a half and the nines and so forth, which I looked at them and thought maybe they deserve a little bit more. But that's my call. That's just how I see it as a judge. But you, all of you as a judge, you're going to see things the way you see it. And that's what's going to count. OK. Um, and again, those are all listed as free position. OK, degree of difficulty. The only reason I put this in here is because you're going to hear that that it's announced. You as a judge, you do not need to worry about the degree of difficulty at all. That's for the table and for the referees to know about and to deal with. You judging a dive, you don't care about how a degree of difficulty designates how easy or how hard a dive is. You put all that aside. It's not going to matter. No matter what dive is put before you, the degree of difficulty doesn't matter. You just need to be aware of it, that it's there. You know, you're working as a table, then you can worry about that when you got to do computation. But you as a judge, uh-uh. Put degree of difficulty out of your mind. Don't worry about it. It does, has nothing to do with what you're going to be doing as a judge, okay? Your scoring scale, this was adjusted a few years ago. It's on page 16 of our handbook. Okay, it's in line with USA Diving, FINA, high school, you name it. Um, it's all listed in here. Um, and you as a judge, when you get to using your, your scorecards here, these wonderful things here, okay? Well, some of you have seen those things. You're going to get real familiar with those things. Um, I would expect you to be able to use every one of those numbers freely as you see fit. When you see that score, whatever that dive deserves, no matter what, anybody else may be scoring to your left or your right or whatever, use the whole scale, okay? That perfect dive is going to get a 10 every time. If you think it's perfect, give it a 10, okay? Those very good dives, which you're going to see that with uh, a, a lot of the experienced divers, 
you know, a lot of their dives hang out and, and, you know, the eights, the eight and a half, the nines and so forth, you know, you know, technically seven to eight is what we call good, but we do have those that kind of raise the bar a little bit and uh, they get very good dives. Um, so they're in that eight to nine and a half, eight and a half to nine and a half range there. A lot of the dives you're going to see in this league, especially with the younger ones, probably going to fall somewhere. They may scrape into the good category, but a lot of them are going to be in the satisfactory range. Um, and that's not a knock on the kids. They're just developing. Okay. And, you know, a lot of this is, is, and again, you as a judge, you may, you may choose to, to score that um, a little more leniency and that's okay. Because again, we're, we're developing our divers, but, the key through all this, no matter what the score is, you want to make sure you leave yourself, as they say, a little bit of elbow room, a little bit of room to um, give those scores accordingly, because, you know, where you establish yourself as a judge is going to be key to how the rest of, you know, that round goes and how you score the other divers for that particular round. And you notice I say by the round, because you can always make adjustments to yourself as you go along. We'll talk about that um, as we go in here. One of the things you're going to hear a lot of uh, when the referees get involved and in having to uh, indicate what I call infractions or the violations, if you will, um, and we'll talk about those, that's where you're going to start hearing about deficient dive. When you hear a referee declare a dive deficient, uh, you're going to be right here where they're going to say, well, you, your most you're going to give is a four and a half. You, you're going to see that a bunch um, in, in cases. And then, you know, the more extreme cases here, if a diver has done something completely, you know, out of whack where they didn't quite fail the dive, the referee may call that unsatisfactory thing going on here. Well, that's where you're going to see that two point maximum score. No matter how you see it as a judge, you know, you're always going to evaluate every dive exactly how you see it. And your score is going to be indicated unless the referee says, hold on, I'm declaring this deficient or I'm declaring this unsatisfactory, then the referee would tell you, well, this is the most points you can give. But again, you as a judge are always going to be scoring that dive exactly as you see it. But you as a judge also may be looking at it and say, yeah, I heard you say, you know, that was a deficient dive, but I still only want to give it a three. And that's okay too. So there's going to be those nuances going on that then the fallacy is, you know, I see that a lot in the league where if a judge says, oh, no, got to call four and a half max and everybody maxes at four and a half. Well, that doesn't have to happen that way. You as a judge could take it a little bit lower if you feel that that dive deserves to be a lower score. OK, point being is that you got a whole scale uh, to work with. OK, now let's talk about some of the criticals and standards here, your criteria here that you need to uh, keep in mind when you're doing this, uh, the critical stuff, if you will. Um, remember, you're gonna score all four parts of the dive. I know I've mentioned this already, uh, but you're, I, I wanna reinforce that to you. It's all four parts of the dive for every dive, okay? And don't consider the DD as I mentioned that. That means nothing to you as a judge. The only thing you wanna know is that what is the dive you're expecting and you're gonna focus on that. You want to provide that fair contest at all times, okay? You're judging the dive, not the diver. Remember, I said that already a few times here. I'm trying to make sure everybody, you know, focuses to that. You don't care who the diver is. That may be the superstar, you know, all-star from years past or whatever. It makes no difference. When it comes down to it, folks, when you're judging a dive, it's a different day. It's a different meet. And it's a different situation because maybe... Maybe you have that in your head that you've seen this diver before or whatever, what you think you're going to expect. You need to learn to put all that aside. All you're, all you're going to see is a dive. That's all that matters. That's what this is going to come down to. And I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to keep bringing that point up there. So, and as you go along, you're going to be looking for those deductions as they apply. There's going to be referee call, but a lot of this is going to be you as a judge making calls and doing point deductions. We'll talk about that. Okay, so the point deductions involved here uh, between the judges and the referee calls. So for the different parts of the dive, okay, let's go back to approach. Um, one second, please. 
Um, now, talking about the approach, let's break this down a little bit. So we talk about, you know, when a diver goes around and, you know, maybe walking or whatever to establish, to get to, get to whatever the starting position is, whether it's on the end of the board or back near the stand or whatever. Once that starting position, once that diver gets set, we're good. But if that diver never does get set and they take off to do their dive, you as a judge need to start looking and that's where you can start deducting points. Anywhere from one to three points. A diver, no matter what dive it is, has to establish a starting point. If they don't, you as a judge need to take points off for that, okay? So in the running or the standing start, if that diver makes an obvious attempt to start an approach or the press, you know, if they start the approach or they're doing a running approach or a forward approach, or they're standing on the end of the board and they start oscillating and then they stop or something like that, if, if, if a dive, if they're beginning the dive and they stop and then they restart and then they do the dive, the referee is going to call what's called a balk, okay? And what that means is that you as a judge, you're still going to evaluate that dive exactly how that dive was done. You know, you set aside the fact that the person did a balk, but once they restart, you're, you're now looking at the start of that dive again and evaluating all four parts. Once the dive is completed, should they go ahead and not balk a, a second time, the dive is done. You're gonna score it exactly as you see it. From that point, from restart to when that dive is completely done. That's when the referee will say, put his hand up or her hand up and say, I'm declaring a balk. And it will tell you as a judge, you score that dive exactly as you saw it. And you say, okay, I saw that is a five. And you put up your score. You're holding up a five. The referee is going to instruct the announcer. Announcer, please deduct two points off of each of the judges' scores. So when they go around and read all the scores, you've got up a five. You're going to hear the announcer say three. That is correct. Because they've taken two points off of your score because the diver balked on that attempt of the dive. Okay, so again, if a the diver starts and stops and does something else that uh, a, a, does two box in the same dive, the referee will have to fail the dive. And then it just becomes, uh, you know, it's, it's failed. Not an incomplete dive, but it's, it is, does end up being a failed dive. Excuse me. So the running dive must incorporate. It must incorporate at least one step in our league. I know in other leagues and even high school, you're required to have, you know, several more steps in there but in our league the idea here is that you're not going to have the little ones coming in here and start bunny hopping down the board that's a problem they need to do if they're doing a running approach they got to take at least one step before they do their takeoff and hurdle they got to have at least one step in there you're going to see a lot of them do pretty much just that especially the ones that are just learning it and that's okay but what you do like to see is they have a few steps in there that would be optimal. But again, in, in our league here, where the kids are just developing their talents and just starting to learn, you know, the technique and so forth, that's, you know, they may, they may just do that one, you know, or two steps are more likely, but they got to do at least one, at least according to the rules. And if they don't do that, the, and the referee sees that, that's going to be called uh, a balk as well. Okay. Um, that's where it becomes a problem. Okay. Um, and again, they need to make sure that when they do their hurdle, okay, and they come up and they, they come down, they land on the end of the board. But we'll talk about that in the takeoff here. So use of a standing and running approach is entirely up to the diver, okay? If they can get away with, you know, performing whatever they choose to perform, that's fine. But here's a key point on takeoff that for you as a judge need to keep in mind. There is going to be a height difference that you're going to see in terms of how the divers work the board. If they're going to do a running approach where they have a hurdle, they're already starting to operate that board in their favor. If they have a running approach where they have up into a hurdle and then they come down and they're able to come down and do a press where they're working that board to get themselves, you know, spring themselves off the board, well, that's a lot different then what you're gonna see is somebody who is doing a standing approach, okay? 
And I'm not talking about doing the back dives or the inwards. I'm talking about doing the difference between a running approach and standing on the end of the board. You as a judge are going to see a height difference. You're always going to see a height difference. The exception might be some of these older divers that might be able to pull it off. But you as a judge ought to be considering that very fact right there. Your expectation would be that they're going to get more height if they're incorporating that hurdle and the press on the end of the board to get themselves sufficient height to do whatever those positions are they need to do to get good clear height before they straighten up and come down to finish their entry. It's a big, big difference between that and you'll see that. You're going to see a lot of that where the kids are starting out of the board. They, and if it, the younger ones, God bless them, you know, they, they start there and they do a little bit of press and they get themselves just a little bit of height. Okay. That's all well and good, but it's not good height. What they want to do is work on doing that running approach and get themselves a better height. They get that as they develop and that's fine. Okay. But that's the point there. Okay. Now the flight through the air. Okay. This is where the dive positions come into play. Now, this is where the, some of the criteria come in here. Okay. Um, I like to think that this is where a lot of the problems occur, if you will. Um, hey, not hey, always. Hey, Steve, can I interrupt you for a second? Please do. Okay. There's a question. I think um, Carol asks if you can uh, talk about the exaggerations of the little guys when they do their hurdle. I'm sorry. What's, what is it about the hurdle? So Steve, when the little guys especially start coming up, I mean, you can't give them cute points, but they really deserve them because it's when they do the exaggerated one, two, three. What is the correct way to score that? Because technically they've done the steps, but it, it's not the smooth fluid movement and it's cute, but it's not, you know, what we're okay. looking for. Carol, I'll tell you this. I have already written it in here uh, near the end of this presentation. I address the cuteness uh, factor. And I borrow that directly from Doug when he talked about that. Um, Thank you. You're, you're not, but I'll, I'll say this for right now. You're not judging somebody about how cute they are. Because no. that's an unfair advantage because you know there are plenty of divers that are absolutely adorable. Yes. Yes. And the littler, the better. And there are some that it's, you know, like Doug said, it ain't their fault, you know, <laughs> just not cute. Okay. And that's not a slight. I'm not throwing that at anybody in particular, but Carol, to your point, to everybody else's point, as I said, you're not judging the diver. You are judging the dive that very dive at that moment you don't care who that is or whatever whatever it may be you know you as a judge can incorporate whatever aesthetically pleasing factors are in to how you evaluate that but technically speaking you want to know are they meeting the appropriate criteria you know do they have smoothness do they have grace um the fact that they just look adorable while they're doing it is not the point. What is the point is that are they actually meeting those criteria? Are they doing that with what I like to also say responsibility of the, of the diver? Because they have the responsibility to, to do that dive completely and do it as well as they can to their ability. But of course, that's where we come in. There's going to be different levels, different grades of how that dive comes out. So the cute factor, <clears throat> sorry, but we got to put that aside. I hope that answers your question, at least for the moment. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. Does that, does that work for you, Carol? Yes, yeah. it's great. Thank you. Good. Okay. So back to this. Okay. Now, all the flights. Okay, all the things that are going on up here. Okay, up in the air. I'm always putting my hand up here. I'm saying, yeah, you guys are up here. Okay, that's where they're at. That's the flight through the air. Straight position. That body is held straight at all times. The legs are straight. There's no bending of the hips. They are straight in line. Keeping in mind that, that we have a whole variety of different body shapes and so forth. What may not look like they're like this 
generic straight line. That's okay. You're going to see when the diver is doing it straight and whether or not. Okay. But the point is, is that there's a straight position that body's held straight. The legs are straight. The, the, there's no bending at the hips, not at the knees and the toes are pointed. Okay. So if in a straight position and they, uh, if they start bending at the knees or the hips or anything during the flight, and perhaps even when they do entry, because when they go in, they're supposed to hold that nice and straight. Um, that's where the referee can come in. You may look at that whole dive and say, you know, I think I was a five and a half. Okay, that's fine. After you've evaluated it, you may even say it's a six. But the referee can, can declare an infraction has happened. He'll call, if it's partially going into another position, that's what we call a break in position. Several years ago, that used to be just a judge's call. We changed that a few years back to make it a referee call. Now we can get into the whole argument about why that happened, why that didn't happen or whatever. But the point is the referee can say, yeah, you can see that break, that it didn't hold it straight or there was something. Uh, you'll see that when they're trying to do a straight position and trying to do a somersault. Some divers kind of push, you know, they're trying to get the rotation and then you see them start to, start leaning into a pike when they're supposed to stay straight. That's what we call a break in position. That's where the referee can say, okay, I'm only giving you four and a half points. That's all I'm going to, that's all you're allowed to give judges. Even though you think it's a five and a half or a six, the most you can give is a four and a half. And that's what you're going to have to put up. Okay. Now the pike position right there, um, that's where they are allowed to bend at the hips, at the hips of the waist. That's fine, but the knees have to stay straight and the toes have to be pointed and the legs need to stay together as best of their ability that is, okay? But they should be able to go ahead and get their feet together and the toes pointed in a nice aesthetically pleasing manner. So if the knees end up bending somewhere along the line there, okay, um, that also can be called a break in position because they need to keep their legs locked, their knees need to be straight. If they're doing the pike, and even coming out of the pike when they're straightening up to go to do their entry, they need to keep everything locked up, okay? Um, and again, the referee, if sees that it, those knees are starting to bend, they're starting to cheat. And technically speaking, that's becoming a rather bad uh, tuck, if you will. It does lean into that, but that is a break in position if they don't keep their knees and their legs straight, that, that goes away from being the pike, you're going into another position. So the referee can call a break in position for that. Again, you may have a higher score, you may have having a lower score and that's okay. But the most that you're gonna be able to post up if the referee declares a break in position is four and a half, okay? Now in that tuck position and the flight through the air, okay? The body is bent at the hips and the knees together. The knees and the feet, should be together um, by, by all accounts, they do the best they can. Not all kids are gonna be able to do it. Uh, they're, they're just not built that way, but they should be able to at least keep their toes pointed while they're doing that, when they're doing a nice, you know, balled up tuck and so forth. Now, I talk about the open knees in the tuck position. That's when we uh, have those, like we say, they have their knees apart. Uh, some refer to that as a cowboy position. As I mentioned earlier, you see Olympians do that stuff. They're allowed to do that, but we don't allow it here. Okay. Um, but they open up their knees when they're doing their tuck and it gets kind of out of, out of control. You as a judges can take a point or two off of that. It's your call, but you have that to your discretion. Okay. Now free position, as I mentioned, a combination of any of those three, one or one or two or all, whatever it may be. Okay. Um, so using, uh, using the twisting dives is listed on the table of dives. That's important because that's all we're allowed to use, what we have listed in the book. Those are the only dives that we have, and that's all they could be doing. Again, that'd be more of a referee's concern. You just, you're just evaluating that dive. So tuck position may be used in certain free positions. I mentioned this earlier. These are the dives that they're actually listed. Don't get too hung up on that, but you can look those dives up and you kind of picture in your head what the dive should look like. And you can say, yeah, I could use a combination. If it incorporates a tuck into that, that's fine. 
But as I mentioned earlier, most of these twisting dives, free position, it's going to be a combination of the straight and a pike. And that's generally it. But there will be some specific ones where if they try to use a tuck position to any of these dives that they're other than the ones I have listed here, that's something the referee should be catching. I would say you as the new officials, if you catch it, great. Um, but if you don't, don't sweat it. But you ought to be aware of it. And I don't want to dismiss this and say, you know, forget it. That's not what I'm saying. You should be aware of it. But that's actually a referee's responsibility to catch that if an illegal tuck is being used. That's why I put it in here about that. That's another thing. That ends up being a referee call. If he sees that illegal use of tuck, that is where it is declared a deficient dive, four and a half point max. Again, you're aware of it. Don't get too hung up about it. Okay. Um, moving on here. The referee shall declare dive unsatisfactory and instruct the judges to award no more than two points max if the dive is performed clearly, clearly in a position other than what was announced. Sometimes you're going to get those divers that go up there and they've been practicing doing, uh, you know, a pike position on a dive or they've been doing a tuck position on a particular dive. And then sometimes they lose their head. And even though they hear a dive being announced and they go up and perform a dive, they're supposed to do it in the pike. And the next thing you see is they did it in a tuck. Okay. Well, they picked the wrong position. That's what we call clearly in a wrong position. That's just one of many examples of it. The referee sees that, declares it unsatisfactory. And no matter what you all are scoring, the most you can give as a judge is the two points. Okay. Um, and then the referee shall declare the dive deficient. That's what I was mentioning earlier about unsatisfactory and deficient. Well, here are the, the, the deficient. No more than four point max. If you have that break in position, that's why I say partially in another position. So there is a distinct difference between what's going on there. If they're in a straight position, they clearly fold down 90 degrees into a pike or whatever. And the referee thinks that's clearly, clearly in another position and calls that that's what it is. But if the referee doesn't call that and you see that that's clearly another position, you as a judge can just go ahead and throw it up as a two. That's fine. Because sometimes referee might miss it. Hopefully not. But it does happen. And that's okay. Um, you as a judge, you've got that discretion there. You see something, you know it's clearly illegal. You go ahead. You can, you can score it as such. And that's totally fine. Okay. But there's that difference between just kind of leaning into and breaking a position to just being completely out of position. That's, that's going to be pretty clear distinction. But you as a judge, you've got that flexibility because they start leaning in and they're doing more towards it. That's really not the right position. You as a judge can decide how you want to score that. You have that ability. Okay. Now, a couple things of note on twisting dives here. Okay. Divers are not allowed to begin a twist before their feet leave the board. In our league, we declare that as a failed dive if the referee catches that. You as a judge, if you see that a diver starts turning the shoulders and their feet haven't left the board, you can fail that dive if the referee doesn't. But technically speaking, in our book, in our league, that's failed. And unfortunately, in our league, that's the harsh that is a harsh, uh, it's more harsh than other leagues. Other leagues, even high school and others, don't fail the dive, but we still have it listed as failed. I, I think it's unnecessary, but that doesn't matter. That's our rule, and that's what we got to stick with uh, and, until you see otherwise. But they can't start twisting on the board. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting political here. Um, um, and it also, it's a failed dive. For those, you know, you're looking at the twisting dives. Um, when the diver, whether they're going in feet first or head first, um, the question becomes, have they twisted enough or are they over twisted? So that's why we say, if a diver has twisted less than the 90 degrees, like for example, they're doing a 5111 where they're supposed to come up off the board straight and then they're supposed to turn 180 degrees and go in like a back dive, if they haven't quite made it 
you know, to 90 degrees before they hit the water, they're still doing a front dive. They're not doing a 5111. So hence they're doing the wrong dive. And that's why it would be a failed dive if they haven't gotten enough twist. Of course, there's also those who end up twisting and they over rotate. So once they have contact with the water, the criteria is that where the shoulders are once contact with the water has happened, okay? So that's the difference between whether a dive is actually what it is they said they're performing as opposed to something else, okay? Then they've done the wrong dive. But point is, is that that's something that a referee should catch when they're that close and the referee doesn't call it. Unless you're absolutely sure, you're going to score it like it is. And you're probably not going to give it a very good score anyways. But perhaps where you're sitting in the chairs, whether you're across the pool from the ref or next to the ref or two seats over or whatever, you may see it at your angle that the shoulder positions didn't make it. So just because a referee doesn't fail, it doesn't mean you don't have to. You may see it as failed. That's okay. Point is, is that you got to call it like you see it. And that's okay. Um, entry, the, the, the problems there on entry is that a referee can declare a four and a half point max. If on a feet first entry, those arms are up above the shoulders and the head. If the arms are up here, unless it's a jump, jump's the only thing excluded from arm position when going into the water on a feet first. The arms need to be clearly uh, clearly down not up here so if the arms are up here somewhere you know you as a judge if you see these arms are out to the side and they're not quite up there in violation of making a four and a half point max you know those arms are in the wrong position anyways feet first those arms need to be down unless it's a jump okay um and on that head first entry they need to make sure their hands are well above they can't be back if the hands are back that's also a four and a half point max um and the referee can and, and should be declaring the dive failed if on a head first entry, somehow or another, the feet end up touching. You get that when you have them not getting enough rotation and not enough height and they hit the water and somehow or another, they're trying to twist out of it and then their, their feet end up brushing the water before their hands, where their hands are really going first. Well, they've done the wrong dive, so the dive has failed and vice versa. You know, if the hands end up touching where the feet were supposed to go in, that's failed as well. Those are those things that are going to be really close calls. But if it's very clear, the referee is going to take it out of your hands anyways and fail the dive. And you won't have to worry about scoring it. OK, now other calls that are going to happen here. Referee is authorized to have a dive um, repeated. You know, you can have something where there is a, a clear distraction, no fault of the diver. It does happen. You know, the pool whistles, things like that are one thing. But if all of a sudden, like a cannon shot or something that just really throws the, you know, I don't know. It could be anything. It could be any of these unfortunate things. Um, it could be a thunder. Well, of course, if there's thunder, everybody's getting out of the pool anyways. But anything that is not the diver's fault, and if the diver needs to have that dive repeated and request that, the diver can ask the referee. Not the coach. It's going to be the diver. And usually the referee is going to say, sure, go ahead, you know, repeat the dive. They're going to reannounce the dive. Diver's going to go ahead and do it again. That's fine. You have those situations that sometimes the announcer just announces the wrong, uh, the wrong dive. Um, you know, the diver knows what dives are doing. The next one, the next one, they know what their, 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 their arsenal of dives are going to be. But sometimes it gets announced incorrectly and all that. And that's not the fault of the diver, but, Hopefully everybody's got their ears on and they hear whether the right dive is being announced. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Okay. Um, so again, that is a request of the diver, not the coach. Okay. It's important because that's the diver's responsibility for doing that dive. And at that point, that's when they, they ask the question, can they have it repeated? Okay. Other calls. Now, I point out here about the whole thing about assisting divers and all that. Again, when the divers are walking around, they're getting ready to get set and all that, and they're talked to, there's not a problem. If during the dive, they're performing the dive, they're running along, and then somebody interviews, intervenes, say, hey, you got this and they got twist or whatever, you know, 
sometimes you get that in training where coaches give you that little click or something weird like that. And you, you, you know, the referee hears that any kind of assistance that's given while the diver is performing the dive. That's why you notice that it's usually pretty quiet while it's going on. There's no assistance. Great. But if there is assistance during that dive, the referee could declare that a failed dive because the diver got assisted. However, the in-between here is that after a diver clearly sets a position, okay, and the coach says, hey, you're doing a back dive, and then ends up making the diver reset. They actually never started the dive, but they had to go and reset to a different position, okay? That's where you're assisting the diver after they set, but they haven't started the dive. They haven't started an approach. If that's the case there, that's where the referee can declare a balk. So there's that fine line. Again, you're aware of it, but that's always going to be a referee call. Don't get too hung up about it. You just need to be aware of it. Okay. Now, just a summary of all these things that are going on that we've already talked about here. What ends up failing a dive completely? Uh, assistance, as I just touched on. If the diver goes up and does the wrong dive, clearly just gets out of their head and does the wrong dive or something, that's the wrong dive. They fail that. If a diver refuses to do a dive, it just decides they don't want to do it, or they're up on the board and they fall in the water for whatever reason, uh, it could happen, but that, that ends up being failed. Um, the over and the under twisting, as we talked about, we'll talk about a little bit of detail in some of the dives I'm going to show you. Um, again, twisting from the board in our league, that's illegal completely. So if you see it, or if the referee sees it, they're going to fail the dive. Um, the incorrect head or feet entry, as I mentioned, whether, you know, what, what's supposed to hit first, we talked about that. And then the two box that might happen in the same dive, that's where the, that's going to be another referee call. Okay. The two point deductions here, a lot of this is the box that we already talked about the uh, start, stop, restart. I mentioned about um, the takeoff from the hurdle, no doing this bunny hop stuff. The one thing to keep in mind, I want to bring it up now is uh, uh, again, we have two types of different uh, uh, types of hurdles that happen. We've got the less experienced divers that do the typical two, three, four step hurdle. And then they, you know, they're doing their, their hurdle and then they're doing their two feet down at the end of the board. And then they take off flight through the air. But we've got more experienced divers to have that kind of different approach. Uh, what it's two, three, four, and then it's called a hop hurdle. That's perfectly okay. That's, and they do that, that's part of their continuous flow and, and their technique and how they approach their hurdle. It, 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 it's, it's very prevalent in our experienced divers. But the point is, is that both of those approaches are okay. The hop hurdle or the two, three, four, five step hurdle, that's totally fine. But what I'm talking about is that when you get the little ones where they just standing there and then they start hopping down the board or whatever, they're doing this hop hop and all that then a hurdle that's not good okay you can't you can't do a hurdle from both feet it's got to be from one foot one or the other you know pick one um so and then the other one here diver assumed incorrect starting position is verbally corrected that's why i was saying assistance was given after they set their starting position that's okay uh except that they can restart or whatever but that's no it's not okay that ends up being a buck so that's where the referee is going to declare that. Okay. Um, again, the deficient dives, as I mentioned, the four and a half point max. Again, this is just reviewing what we talked about. The arms in the wrong position, except for jumps. Feet first, the arms need to be, be down. Okay. Uh, illegal use of the tuck. Again, don't get too hung up about that. That's something you can, we can talk about uh, you know, another time there, but that's mainly a referee's concern about using illegal tuck um partial break uh, the breaking position partially going into a different position the two-point max the unsatisfactory dives um the wrong position as i mentioned but the other thing here the unsatisfactory this is again another rule we put in like two three years ago where we clarified this um to make sure there was a clear understanding when i talk about divers not getting enough height to do their rotations or whatever, you're going to see a bunch of that where they're just still doing their rotation and, and they're like almost on in the water doing it. If they're doing certain rotations and say they're, say they're supposed to be doing a feet first entry, but once they make contact with their water and their feet made it, 
technically they're they're in the right uh, position to go in, but they haven't come out of the tuck or they haven't come out of the pike. If they haven't made that effort, and we call this sincere effort, if you will, if you can clearly see that that hasn't happened, you shouldn't be giving any more than two point uh, at the most. But that's going to be a referee call anyways, um, because they didn't come out of the pike or the tuck when they're performing that again, that has everything to do with the fact they just didn't get enough height when they're doing all this stuff. They really need to make sure that they get enough spring off the board and everything gets done up here and then straighten up. If they don't do that and they're, they're just coming off the board and trying to throw a double, they're not going to make it. You know, they may technically have not failed it, but they're going to get an unsatisfactory. And most times it's going to be that referee call in that. Okay, your calls as a judge, some of the other deductions, a half to two point deductions. Um, again, mentioned about where the tuck position is. Um, those knees need to be together. They don't need to be spread apart and so forth. The other thing here, I mentioned a couple things on the back dives, which would be a back dive or the inwards or any of the twisting dives that involve a, uh, you know, a back or inward. Um, if they're on the end of the board and they're just doing a whole lot of oscillating and, you know, uh, working the board too much, too much rocking the board, if you will, you know, in my world, or what I think is a good point, the good divers only do two or three oscillations before they do their press and they take off. But there are going to be some of the younger ones that are going to be sitting there and working the board like, you know, 20 times or something. Like that. That's just way too many. Okay. I know it's, you know, half to two points, but, you know, consider what they're doing there. You need to consider that as a judge to take points off because they can't stand there all day and just keep rocking the board. OK, the other thing that happens, especially you'll see this with the more experienced divers to get a little more oomph on their final press on the board. You're going to see that thing called crow hopping. And those who know what I'm talking about, they get on the end of the board, they're pushing the board. And you see this, they're, they're, they, they're doing not the very last press, but the one before that, or maybe even a couple times before that, where they're pushing the board and they're separating themselves or coming off the board before they do their final press. That's called crow hopping. So some of them do it rather subtly. Some of them look like they can put Encyclopedia Britannica between them. They come way off the board and it's too much of a problem. A lot of the experienced divers will do quite a bit of that. And my philosophy has been that I try not to pick on them too much, but for your sake here, and even when I, you know, I will call it here, if I see them coming off, I see that crow hopping, I'm going to ding them because they need to keep their contact with the end of the board until they do their final press and they're up in the air. If you see any of that crow hopping, which you're gonna see a lot of that in these videos, that's where you as a judge, you take some points off. Okay, arm positions. Again, I'm talking about where it's not, you know, the, in the deficient area where it's up here. But if they're going into the water and they got their arms like out to the side or something like this, just in the wrong position, you as a judge should be taking points for that. It's your discretion how many you take off. Okay, but usually about two points is about it. So we put it in that category there for you. The one to three point deduction, um, Again, as I mentioned, if that diver is walking around and they're supposed to get start in a set and start position, they don't do it, you take points off, a point to three for that one, if they haven't stopped and then started, okay? Judging the jumps here, um, the, the forward jump can be done either running or standing position, that's fine. But the idea here is that they're, they're going to be a straight vertical line. If they're standing on the end of the board, they're, they're lined up nice and straight. Um, and they need to establish that press on the takeoff. OK. And again, their arms can be wherever they want it to be. But they need the idea of this and, and, and whether they're doing this standing or, as I mentioned, on a running starting position with approach and hurdle, you know, they can do either one. But in any case, they got to keep their body straight. OK, as they're going through all this stuff, you know, and then when they get to the end of the board, they need to make sure when they're doing a the jump, they're not jumping out. They need to be doing more up than out. The guy go out a little bit, but they need to get more height. Those wonderful jumps, the ones that do it right, will get a nice press, get up in the air 
They'll, they'll get their body straight and then they'll go ahead and determine whether their arms are up or down or whatever. They're gonna make sure they come in nice and straight. That's what they're looking for. They, the body needs to be aligned. It needs to remain straight, okay? Even though it is a free position, the expectation to see is that the body is aligned and it stays straight. Now the back jump, that's always gonna be them standing on the end of the board, just like they're doing the back dive. Same thing, keeping themselves in a straight line. They're on the end of the board. They get themselves a nice little press. They go up more high than they are out. Hit the sweet spot, coming down as vertical and as straight as they can, okay? Um, again, through that flight, that body is to remain nice. Hello. And vertical. Yes. Hi. Hello? Um, hold on. You have a question? Okay. All right. Um, so again, the arm position on the jumps, they can be either up or down when they go into the water. Either one is fine. Okay. Now, I want to talk about real quick about the lineups. Um, in terms of judging these lineups, okay, again, these, as I mentioned earlier, these are skills, whether you're doing a forward lineup or a back lineup, they're all, both of these are starting on the front end of the board, okay? So that front lineup, they're facing outward towards the water. When they go in, there is absolutely no press. There is no press at all. They simply are doing the skill where they're lined up and they fall into the water, that's it. The arms together, that could be up over the head, you know, that's, that's what they want to do. They should have their arms up or whatever. Um, that's up here and they're going in. They, they should be in a safe position, but they're just going to fall in, okay? So again, they're going in. They end up with their head going in. They should have their hands above their head. Same thing with the back lineup. They're going to be lining up. The only difference is they're facing back towards the stands. They need to be nice and straight. Again, no press. They're simply going to fall back into the water. That's the skill that they're doing. It's how well they do that skill is where you all come in. They can't go and, you know, uh, you know, flailing off and doing anything else, not showing any press. A good, a good lineup is going to be just that where they simply just fall back. It's kind of difficult to do, but they do it. Now, when it comes to this, the front lineup and the back lineup are those that can replace uh, for any of those required dives that require a front dive, they can do the 001 instead of the 101. Um, and then if they have to do a back dive and they don't want to do a back dive, they're going to do a back lineup 002. That's totally fine. Um, if it happens to be that they list that they're doing a dive and they end up doing a lineup, that's where the referee will come in and do whatever corrections that need to be done in terms of if they end up doing a lineup, this is where they can change the dive on the sheet and it won't fail the diver. The referee will simply declare that a lineup has been performed and tell you as a judge to score it as a lineup, not a dive that it may have been announced. Okay, so that's the only difference. Don't get too hung up on that, but you do know what you're looking for when it comes to these lineups, okay? So the summary here real quick, okay? The box, we already talked about the illegal movement by the divers, okay? The false starts, all that good stuff. Um, again, if they haven't set, set a set position, no big deal. Um, if they do that illegal takeoff, we talked about that. The break of position, the arms we talked about, um, incorrect position of the dive, things like that oscillating on the board, you know, just, you know, working it too much. We talked about that again, you know, good divers only need, uh, you know, three or four oscillations and they're done. And then they're off the board. You're going to see a lot more of that with the younger kids they are going to be doing a lot of oscillations. And that's a problem. The crow hops again, should be that half two point deduction by the judges. Um, I say control is a factor there because part of that equation is the fact when they crow hop, you would think they'd be coming back down the same spot of the board, but that isn't always the case. That becomes a safety issue when they come, they come off the board to come back down the press, and then all of a sudden they're in a different position. That's where they're not having any good control otherwise. But crow hopping is a problem here, and then when you see it, you got to call it. Um, so, again, the complete dive, as we've talked about all these elements here, and I hope I've, I've given you enough information here, okay? Um, so this is when a diver has established that set position we talked about. Um, 
That's the beginning of the dive. Once they've established, that's where they are. And all through all four elements that make up the dive, as I mentioned, until the entire body is completely below the surface of the water, you know, the diver is passed below there and they, you don't see them, they're in the water, that's the end of the dive, okay? So again, once they establish your start position, you start looking at everything that goes on from there until that diver is completely underwater. That's your, that's your box, that's your frame of what you're judging right there with all four parts there, okay? And again, you're not considering anything before or after, okay? Now, here we are. You got all the tools here. You guys got yourself all set here, okay? So the diver's ready to go and so are you, okay? So when that dive is announced, okay, uh, it's gonna be a 103C. So you got a picture in your head. Okay, well, I knew, and now I know what a 103C is. Again, it's a one and one half somersaults and they're going to ball into a nice tuck and they're going to be coming out of that tuck up here not down here they're going to come in nice and straight okay so now you see that you got that picture in your mind you know you're going to look at all four parts of dive so now you got to focus you got to focus 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 on what's going on you don't care about anything else that's going on you've now heard a dive you know what it is you don't care who that diver is all you care about is you heard that this dive is going to be performed and you don't care who it is. It could be your own kid, could be your neighbor's kid, could be anybody else. You could have whatever expectation. If you put all that aside, you're looking at a dive being performed at that very moment in time right there with all those elements. Now I picture what that thing's going to look like. Now I want to go ahead and take a look at it. So I'm going to run another one here and hopefully this doesn't come out all mucked up like it was. The other one was just too murky and all that stuff. So what I want to do is make sure that I'm, I'm looking here. I want to run this through. So you're going to judge all four parts of this dive, okay? So she's got herself back on the board. She's by the fulcrum here. That's her starting position. So she's set, okay? So remember all four parts of the element. So this is going to happen quick. So when you see this dive, you're going to see all those parts, consider all those. So when it's done, that's where you kick into action. So here, let's go ahead and run it. So again, it's gonna be announced. This is a 103B. So this is a forward one and one half somersault. She's gonna do it in a pike position. So what you're seeing is legs are straight, toes pointed. She's bending at the hip when she does her rotation. Okay, so here we go. That's her approach. She's up off the end of the board, does a rotation and goes in. Okay. Now, the dive's been performed. Okay, you're considering all four parts of the dive, the approach to takeoff, the flight and the entry. So you got to ask yourself quickly, did the diver meet your criteria on all of that? Some of it, none of it, you know, was the dive a complete bomb? You know, was it, was it done relatively nice, relatively smooth? So you determine your score quickly, considering all those and all those deductions. So once you have it, and when you're signaled to, okay, you're coming up with your score, whatever it may be, you know, and so forth, and you're thumbing through that, okay? You've got your score, you're not showing your score until it, you're asked to. So you're gonna put up your score, whatever it may be, this is arbitrary, you know, um, and you wanna put it up so, Wherever the announcer is, you clearly put it up so the announcer can see it, okay? Making sure wherever you're sitting, if you have to go through somebody sitting to your right or whatever, or to your left, you wanna make sure you're make sure that, that that announcer can see that score. Don't make your announcer's life difficult. Just make sure you're in a position to show it. So how the scores are announced, the announcer is going to do the same chair order, meaning they're going to go, they're going to announce all the scores clockwise around with all the judges or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter, but it has to be consistent. They're not going to go crossways or whatever. You're going to go around uh, clockwise or go counterclockwise. Why is that important? Because you want to make sure that the score that you gave is what's getting announced unless there is a deduction that's been declared by the referee, okay? What's important there is that you know what score you put up, 
and you make sure that the announcer reads that correctly, which translates to the head table, who will record it correctly, then they can determine what the scores are. Now, the other trick in scoring is that once they've, uh, once they've announced it, see what I'm doing here is I'm kind of keeping my finger on the scorecard. We'll talk about that also. You know, you want to make sure you hold scores until you know you're ready to do the next one, because sometimes scores get repeated. And you as good judges, you're going to make that score. And then once that's done, you put all that out of your head and you're ready for the next one. They're like, oh, can you put, you put up scores again, please? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I do remember because I have my finger on it. Yeah, see? Now I can put it up. Now I can show it again. And I'm all good. Little tricks there when doing your scoring. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, again, you want to make sure your score is being read correctly. Okay? So again, there's your scorecards, as I just showed you there. Uh, most of them have the same type that, you know, this type, you know, there it is. It, that, that isn't, that picture isn't this one, actually. I stole that off of, uh, well, I don't know where I stole it from. It wasn't our website, but I borrowed it. How about that? Um, other things that you as a judge can use. These are quite handy. Again, get the handbook. If you don't already have a copy of the 2019 or you can get it off the website. We've got the whole thing cover to cover, inside and out. Um, the other thing that's good to have, this is on our uh, website as well. This is the official's worksheet. This is nice because it gives you that distinction between what the referee calls and the judge's calls and what both of them may be in tandem are the same call, but you'll see who has what responsibility for point deductions and so forth. Real handy to have. This is really good to review, certainly before the meet, and before a referee has to, a discussion with you. So you're all on the same page. It's very helpful to have, um, at least take time to review that going into a dive meet. So you're, you have that awareness and reminders, okay? Now, a couple of do's and don'ts. Um, we're almost at the end of our, my, my slide presentation and we'll get into showing some of the, uh, the dives and go over that. Um, but the way I'll present the dies hopefully be a little better because I don't have them in the PowerPoint here. Anyways, some of the things you, you need to keep in mind here. The do's, yes, you need to be consistent at all times. You're going to be judging every dive you see equally the same. Okay, that's what you're here to do. Um, none of the other you know, discretionary things or whatever you are doing. When you see that dive, that dive at that moment, that's your responsibility. You want to be consistent when you're doing that. And the other part of consistency is when you're scoring, you want to make sure that you're not changing your criteria while we're scoring judges through a particular round. Okay. Because of the way things are all meta, uh, made up here, we have all the events say it's like eight and unders. Okay. All the eight and unders are going to start with their front dives or the front lineups. You're going to be judging each one of those divers exactly the same. If you decide you need to make adjustments for yourself, you don't want to go making adjustments during the round. You want to make it after that round's over. And then you can decide if you need to tweak your, your, you know, your scoring criteria. Because all of you are going to have your own criteria of scoring. I can give you all the tools here to work with. It's how you apply them and how you work those. It's entirely up to you. Because judging is completely subjective. Okay? Keep that in mind. Your scores are yours, and that's okay. You can be a little bit different, but you also want to be fair. And being fair means you're being consistent with each diver and particular to a particular round you're working. Okay. So again, use that entire scorecard, you know, all the way through. If you think that dive deserves a 10, throw up 10. Don't worry about it. If you don't think that dive is worthy of this or whatever, don't give them any score that you're not comfortable with. You go with what you feel is the right score. Okay. If you feel like you've made a mistake and you need to make adjustments, don't worry about it. Everybody's going to make mistakes. You forget about it. You move on. You go from there. Okay. Now, um, the other things you don't want to do is you don't want to be the person that's waiting to see somebody else's score before you throw a score up. Own your own score. Okay. Don't wait for somebody else. You, you make your score. You live with it and go on. Don't worry about if you're a little high, a little low. OK, if you feel like you've made the right score and that's your your criteria, stick with it. 
Don't worry about those around you. It's going to be yours, okay? You also don't want to be the person that's going to go up there and start throwing up your scores early, showing it up on anyone. What you need to do is make sure you only post a score, show the score when you're asked to, okay? That way we have that consistently consistency there and we're being fair to all those around us, okay? Um, so again, you don't want to do it early, okay? Um, again, you're not adjusting yourself to other judges' scores. That's not good either. Again, evaluation process is all you up here. What you think it is, that's what you should go with. Don't, don't feel like you've done some kind of disservice. That's how you see it. And that's what makes you a good judge is that you are consistent, you stick to your guns, and you go with how you, you see that. If you feel like that thing is only worth a five and a half and everybody else is given a seven, that's just the way it is. Don't feel bad about it. That's how you saw that dive. There may be some certain other criteria that you don't think were met that maybe some others thought they were. OK, but you can decide that you can reflect on that. If you feel like you need to make adjustments, fine. Do it after that round's over or do it after that event's over or whatever you feel you need to do. OK, um, again, you just call it like you see it. The other little thing here, that little cheat thing we like to talk about, you know, and, and this goes into what I'm talking about. If you've, you're starting to hear a score is getting up there and you've got a five and you're hearing six and a half, six and a half, and then nobody's looking and all of a sudden, then you end up kind of looking away and you drop that half here where you're padding your score. This is the no-no I'm trying to point out here. You know, you, you call it a five, keep it a five. Don't, don't be dropping this and creating a bigger score because you feel like you're not getting close enough. Don't worry about what everybody else is seeing. You go with what you feel is the right score. And that's all that matters, okay? Now, the distractions, you know, um, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a few of them. Um, the big thing I emphasize to every official, whether you're working the table, you're in the chairs, referee, judge, whatever, you got a cell phone, you, you know, turn it off, throw it in the woods, throw it in the pool, I don't care what you do but you need to turn it off and make sure you're not in a position where you're like, Oh, I got a, I got a call. Hold on diver. Could you hold on one second? No, that's not going to happen. Okay. That doesn't, that's not fair to the kids. Okay. If you're in a position where you have to be on call or something like that, you have to consider whether you should be in the chair to begin with. Okay. Your focus, your dedication to these divers at that moment. So if you're on call, maybe find somebody else to do the judging okay you're not working in a bubble that is so true you're poolside you're hearing every noise on the planet right there you you got all these people around you you're hearing this noise that noise and all that but when it comes down to it and you hear that dive you've got to channel all that out the best you can you're going to be hearing crap this way and that way you're going to get influences and things like that but all that matters is that that moment is that you're focusing on that dive right then and there. That's all that matters, okay? Biases there, you're going to have some of those again. It's like, oh, I know that diver. That doesn't matter. That was a different day. That's a conscious bias that you need to put aside. And there's some of those other things, other nuances in here that are ingrained in you that maybe you just do them subconsciously or whatever. But again, those are dealings you have to kind of work out yourself there. Your job, your focus is just to stick to what you see at that very moment. You need to put all that out. So Carol, coming back to this, there's no points for cuteness, okay? That diver may be the most adorable kid you've ever seen on the planet. It ought to be, you know, in a contest somewhere. I don't know. That doesn't matter. You know, what we're looking at are the fundamentals of the dive. Are they being done correctly? Are they doing it aesthetically? Is it aesthetically pleasing? Are they doing all these things right? That's what matters at that moment, okay? Doesn't matter how cute the kid is or not. And as I said, you know, that we need to put all that aside, okay? Uh, I mentioned about judges getting, you know, the coaches I talked about, you know, there are some coaches that are start giving judges a little bit of grief. Um, you got to put all that aside. The coaches need to just worry about uh, coaching their divers. And I can tell you that, 
you're, you're, you're going to hopefully rarely run into that problem because I think the coaches we have in this league are wonderful. I appreciate everything that they do for our kids. Um, but on occasion, you dig at some of those coaches that might, why are you only giving that? And I'm like, okay, coach, you let the referee worry about handling the coach. The referee ought to have your back, just like you have the referee's back, but ought to have your back because your calls are your calls. Nobody questions them. That's it. So when you start getting a distraction from a coach or something, that's where the ref ought to step in and say, coach, you know, you worry about your job. My folks will do my job. And that's the end of it. Okay. So let's go ahead. I'm going to jump out of this part and I'm going to pull up my file of dives and I'd like to go ahead and I, hopefully you'll be able to see these a little better. Hold on. Let me back out of this one. So, Hopefully you all can stick with me for a moment and I'll go ahead and let me pull up the dives I have and we can talk about those a little bit as I can find my file here. Ah, where is everything hiding now? Oh, goodness gracious. Where does everything go when you need it? Okay, so, yeah, make sure I did this right, folks. Bear with me. Okay, bear with me, folks. Okay, there they are. All right. Okay, I wanted to... Uh, other presentations that I've done in the other days, folks, I had problems showing the videos. And obviously the couple that I showed you through the PowerPoint weren't all that great. And David Stark pointed out to me that it doesn't work too well in PowerPoint. Well, nobody said anything in the first three sessions. So, oops, sorry. <laughs> That's the way it is. So I'm going to go ahead and bring these up and then we'll talk about the different dives. So this is where I want all you all to jump in here. We've got a little bit of time here. Um, and if you all can stick around a little bit longer than the time frame, it'd be, I think it'd be worthwhile. And we can talk about these particular dives. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share my entire screen here and just do it this way. It'll be a lot easier because that way I know I'm not gonna uh, louse this all up completely. Um, so let's do this, okay. So the first dive up, let me see if I get this right. Well, I already screwed that up. I know I don't want to do that. I don't want to open it with that. I want to open this with. Oh, come on. Don't you love that? It tells you it's not responding. Isn't that great? Okay. All right, here we go. Got to open it with this. Got a way to kill this audio on here. Um, now let me let me run that one more time for you all. That was kind of quick there. So this dive here, again, this is a 103B. Again, see what you all think. You all can shout it out or put it in the chat and let me know what you think of it. You open up the chat window here. Okay. So let me go ahead and try to run this. Let me know if it looks like, you know, you can see it okay. For those of you who are new to it, this is real time. This is what you're actually going to see when you're doing these meets. So yeah. you've got to have your head really in the game right away to be able to make the judgments that are there. Okay. So here we go. Here's a, this is a 103B. Let me do it one more time so I don't have the cursor in the way. All 
right, scores, what do you all think? All four elements of that. Five, seven and a half, seven and a half. Okay. Some are more generous than others, that's okay. But that's good. We got we got a, a good a good variety of scores here. That's good. Um, you know, I thought the dive had a good approach, good form, pretty good height. Um, I think I'd probably give it somewhere between a seven and seven and a half, which is generally what folks have been given here. So I think we're all in pretty decent agreement. Is that all good? Okay, let me go ahead and run the next one. The next one's a 203C. That is a back one and one half somersault, and that's going to be in a tuck position. So they're going to be starting on the end of the board, okay? And they're going to be doing their oscillations, and then they're going to be doing their one and a half somersault and then going in. So here's a 203C. Okay, what'd y'all see? That was a that was a back one and one half somersault. Okay, sixes, eights, sevens. Okay. Anybody notice any problems on the takeoff or the uh, the final press? Did that count as her feet leaving the board? Sure looked like it to me. You had a crow hop happen. Yeah, back here, right? Right in here. See, look at that. There's, there's, there's a press. She's up off the board. Look at that. Can you all see that? She's off the board. And then she's coming back down again, that final press. So there's clearly a crow hop, right? Now, how's she looking going in? She's made contact with the water. What's the one She's thing? Slightly under rotated. Notice that her feet aren't exactly together. Separation. There's a word out there. Exactly. See the feet are. She's got the toes pointed, but she's got some separation. But again, those are those things you all are going to have to pick up rather quickly. Okay. So yeah, I mean, all things considered, yeah, she could have used a little bit more height. Um, you know, the form was fairly clean, but the feet were coming apart a little bit. You know, I probably would have put it somewhere about the six category, a six or a six and a half, maybe. But then again, that's how I see it. It may not necessarily be where you are. So in our league, that's probably about right. You know, that's that's going to be one of the better ones we see in our league. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is going to be a 301 C. That's going to be a reverse dive and a tuck position. Reverse dive in a tuck position. So it's going to have a forward approach. You know, it's going to incorporate, you know, the steps, the hurdle, and then it's going to have the, the final press on the end of the board, and then going to have the height in the air doing the uh, reverse, and then coming in, you know, with a tuck, and then coming in as vertical as possible. So here is a reverse dive in a tuck position. see what'd you all see okay those are fair scores sure okay um okay yeah thank you dave so yeah, um, I thought she had a pretty decent approach, but also um, I, I kind of sense that she kind of threw herself out a bit from the board. So she's not necessarily in that three to four point, uh, three to four foot sweet spot, if you will. So you want to see it again? Yeah, I can back this up, play it again. Here we go. Generally speaking, not too bad. Um, like I said, I thought she kind of pushed herself out a little bit. Um, probably could stand a little bit more height. 
Um, but I can say that about a lot of the dyes that we see here. Um, and you're definitely going to see a lot of that in our league. So, um, you know, the, the score is that. Um, the other thing to that you notice is that it wasn't exactly what I call the classic tuck. Um, didn't really come into that complete ball, if you will, that distinctively made it a nice, clean tuck. So my score probably would have been somewhere like a five and a half for that one, considering all those points there. OK. Um, but again, what's important here is what you all think. So let's go with that. OK, the next one is going to be an inward. This is going to be a 401B. So this is where they're going to be standing on the end of the board. And they're going to press off the board, go up, and they're, they're going to be coming down. OK, and they're going to pike. And then they're going to be coming down as vertical as they can, you know, fairly close to the board. They should, again, they should be in that three to four foot spot there, uh, but not too close to the board. So this is a 401B. Scores, please. You see the five and a half, the six, and so forth. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Anybody care to take a dabble on some of the observations? His body twist a little bit. Could have a little bit. It's hard to tell, isn't it? And any twist that he had in there was probably not anything that we would really be concerned about. Does he throw himself one side or the other of the board would be more of a more of an issue. Notice in his case oh, with this press, no crow hop at all. His toes remained in contact with the board the whole time. Almost. <laughs> Hard to tell from this angle if he went to one side or the other. Well, here it is. Board. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you look back on this is that he had everything pretty clean. He has good height here, good form, and he's coming in and straightening out pretty well. You know, just a little, little bit, bit of a there. twist. Yep. A little bit. But here's the other thing to look at, and this is where the subtlety is. Okay. You see his right foot? Right foot's off the board a little bit. Uh, yeah. Just a slight bit. But the, look, the point is, is that you're not going to catch all these little things, but it does happen. I can sit here and overanalyze these things left and right. But from the, the speed and what you see at that moment, it doesn't look like he crow hopped at all, but technically he did just a tiny, tiny bit. OK, it does happen. OK, but you're not going to have that advantage. Say, hey, stop. You got to we got to slow this down. We got to do a video replay. You don't get that advantage. OK, you're going to see it as it is. But what I'm seeing is that you all are putting up some good, consistent scores. Six and a half to seven. Yeah, that's that's probably good. But again, how you feel about it, if you feel it was less of a dive or more of a dive. What's important is that you make that call, you make that score to where you're comfortable with. That's what's important to me and all your fellow officials. You make sure you call it like you see it. Okay, now let's jump in here. Um, well, we got a little bit of time left. Uh, actually, I'm just a little bit over here, but if you all bear with me, uh, we'll go through a few more here. Okay, so here's a twisting dive coming up. This is a 5231. Okay, so that's going to be a back one and one half somersault with a half twist. Now, reading the dive numbers, a five, two, three, one in the free position. Those last two numbers are even numbers. So what that means, he's facing back, he or she is facing back towards the stands. And then that's where they're going to end up in the water. They're going to be facing back, but they're going to be going into the water head first, but facing back towards uh, the stands again. So again, this is a 52-31. This is a back one and one half somersault with a half twist. Okay. Now watch it and see if you pick up on anything. Scores, please. Yep, crow hop. Yep, you got it. You want to see it again? Was that glitchy? Let me replay it.
Oh, goodness. Let me try that again. That's a little better. Then you actually see that. All right. So what'd you all think? Six? Somebody gave us 6.6. There are no 6.6. 6.5. One of the things that affected her dive on that is when she did that crow hop. Remember, Steve was talking about the control. When her feet left the board, she ended up landing again a little bit closer to the stands rather mm -hmm. than the end of the board. And that caused her to throw the dive out a little bit farther away from the board than what she really wanted to do. Other than that, it was, you know, that crow hop really made a tremendous influence on that dive. It could have been much better because everything else was pretty clean. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Overall, the form was really good. It was really clean. Again, you know, you can make the argument uh, probably needed to have a little more height, but that's okay. We don't want to go crazy with that. Okay. So folks, um, with the younger divers, it's going to be kind of hard to tell. I wish I had videos to show you of some of our younger divers because um, that's going to be more indicative of what you're going to be looking at. Um, unfortunately, the only videos I have are these high school diving championships that show you, you know, a lot of the way a lot of dives I'll be looking at, but also a lot of the mistakes that do come up. Um, in terms of the younger divers, this is where, you know, they're just learning these and their technique and their form and their, their aesthetics are going to be different. And I don't want to say they're going to be worse. It's just going to be different in how they present it, because that's just simply how it is when they're just developing these skills. So generally speaking, the scores are going to be a bit lower, if you will. OK, you're going to be seeing that. Um, the best thing I can tell you about any of these dives that you're seeing is that you just need to have some experience out there to see it. And, you know, now you've got the tools to work with. You just need to go ahead and kind of, you know, go ahead and apply that. It'll take time, but you guys will do fine. So, um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's my age. I'm going to expect um, no, you, you, you don't have to have this expectation because of their age, you're going to be throwing ones, twos, or threes, okay? Usually the scores you're going to see anywhere from the three and a halfs up to five and a half and six with a lot of the, the newer kids um, as they, uh, you know, refine their technique and hone their skills, their scores are going to naturally go up. So where you are as a judge, you're going to be seeing a lot of this in the developmental scores. So it's okay if you're going to see a string of kids that are just doing a threes, three and a half. Some are only doing a two and a half, if you will. That's to be expected in this league. What we show you here with these videos, you know, it's not completely indicative of what you're going to see. Certainly you're going to see it with the older kids of 15, 18s, because these are all high school kids that are doing this. And there are some of them that made it in here that have you know much less experience than the others. That's okay. It's all part of it. Everybody understand what I'm getting at? I hope. All right. Um, it's it's nine oh eight. If anybody wants, um, you know, everybody's done great here tonight. If you'd like to stay on, we can run a couple more videos if you like. But I leave it up to the powers that be, to David and uh, Teresa. If you want to call tonight or if you'd like to run a, a few more. Um, as long as, I mean, it's up to the reps. David, how, how, how about you? I'm, I'm um, fine sticking around. Not a problem. I know Steve's got an early morning. What about um, let's end at 915 maybe and just another okay. couple of minutes and then Steve. Yep. Let's go ahead. I'll run through the next set and we'll, then we'll call it a night. How about that? Thank you so much, Steve. And okay. Thank you, everybody. All right, let's go to the next one, okay? The next dive we're going to see is a 103B. Um, it's similar to the first 103, uh, well, the 103B we had on the first one. So let's go ahead and run this one again. Um, look, look and see what kind of approach and things like that. See how this one looks to you all. Again, this is a 103B. This is a one and one half forward somersault in a pike position. Score 
Chorus, please. Six and a half, seven, five and a half. Mm -hmm. Eight, seven, six and a half. Okay. Um, any comments? The approach was kind of crazy. What's that? The approach was kind of crazy. A lot of hops and crow hops. Well, and yeah, this is this is one of the things that you're going to see with the uh, with, you know Steve was talking about these <clears throat> hop and step and jump approaches That's that they're using to work the board a little bit more rather than just straight walking out to the end of the board, doing your hurdle, landing, and doing the takeoff. It's a way of getting more action out of the board, hopefully to get a little bit more height for it. And it does look a little bit funky, but it is acceptable and it's legal. Early crow hops, we were supposed to take off for that. Well, you don't necessarily, as I said, that's acceptable approach there. You know, the hop hurdle there, but what I'm talking about, what you take off for, which could end up being a balk, is when you get the, the little ones where they're just hopping on two feet going down the board. That's not what's going on here, okay? This is a more uh, experienced diver. That instead of just having the steps and then going into the hurdle, they're going to have those things where they're kind of hopping along a little bit here, and they incorporated it in. That's what we call a hop hurdle, and that is acceptable here. So, no, we're not deducting for that. And That's she was doing each of those extra little working hops off of one foot rather than bunny hopping with both feet on the board, working their way down. Makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, she used that hop hurdle there. Um, she did land near the end of the board, um, you know, doing the hurdle. And then it was interesting is that when she came down to do the hurdle, it, it seemed to catch my eye that when she came back to her press, it seemed like instead of being on the end of the board, she came back on the board a little bit and then did her final press to go and, and, uh, and, and go into the air, which, you know, but generally speaking, she was pretty clean with it. And, you know, I, I'd say that's probably a, a seven in my book, but I, you know, I thought pretty well. So let's do the next one real quick. This is going to be a 201B, okay? Um, this is a back dive in a pike position. Oh, that didn't even finish. Let me do that again. I don't know why it's not doing this. Sorry, folks. I don't know why it's playing back so badly. Um, did you all get to see that? I guess you did. You got some it looked good to me, Steve. Huh? It looked good on my screen. I don't know. It just my my little screen here wasn't coming up right. Mm -hmm. All right. So overall, what do you all think? Yeah, you uh, all caught that. Carol, Carol's got it right. You know, when he did his he did his crow hop as he's working his way on on the end of the board, he showed a little bit of a lack of confidence because there was a lot of a lot of oscillation of the board before he got started. And he crow hopped and he actually moved his feet uh, back towards the uh, stands as away from the end of the board. And that's going to cause him to throw the, the dive farther away from the board than he would have wanted. Yep. Dave, what would you give it? Oh, it's probably about a five and a half, six. Yeah. Yeah. I probably would have scooted just a little bit more because I'm generous. But then again, that's why we have all the different scores. So that's good. That's, that's, that, that works for me. All right, let me do the next one. Uh, the next one is a 301C. That's the reverse dive in a tuck position. <laughs> Scores. Five, five, yeah. Four, okay. What did you all see? Yeah, she's far off the end of the board. She also under-rotated. Uh -huh. Notice the, uh, 
when the splash at the very end, the splash is going away from the end of the board. That indicates that she hadn't completely rotated around. Oh, see this? See, see, see this motion right here? She's pushing herself way away from the board. Her momentum is just carrying her because what she ended up doing is instead of going upward, she threw herself outward. And that, that see, she took away a lot of height she could have had. Seems like she's got good height, but the point is that she threw herself out more than upward. And that, that causes a bit of a problem, especially her coming in. She's, she's trying to come in straight, but she's also coming in. And she's, again, she's ripped that water back, as, as Dave was pointing out. Yeah, it's too far out there. That was way out there. She was, she was having to arch her back really, really hard just to be able to bring it yeah. around as close as she did. Yep, yep, absolutely. So, yeah, um, yeah, I'm somewhere in that five and a half, maybe six, but I'd, I'd, I'd be more comfortable at five to five and a half, really, because, it, it you know, there, there's good form that's here, but the problem is, is that it really isn't great form when you don't incorporate and in pushing upward where you really, because you really are affecting your height, You're, you know, she's cheating herself on that, so... That, you know, in, in some respects, it's good form, but a lot of, in other respects, it just kind of fell apart because she, you know, she, she went out further than she needed to. And that's unfortunate. So yeah, throwing themselves out from the, from the end of the board, especially on the reverse dives like that is really not an uncommon thing because going the reverse dive, it's a blind dive. And like uh, uh, happened in the Olympics before people hit the board. Yep. Yeah. It does. Get hurt with that. So they, there's a, a fear factor of doing that blind dive like that one. Okay, let's move on. I got a, an, an inward dive, a 401B. This is an inward uh, dive in a pike position. See what you all think. Let me get this one. Scores, please. I got, you all got the eyes on them crow hops. Yeah, she has a little bit of a crow hop there. But yeah, the score is, yeah, seven and a half, eight, absolutely. Good call, good call. I agree, I couldn't agree more. You know, a little bit of crow hop kind of kills it down a little bit, but overall, that was a well-executed dive. You know, um, I, I, I like the whole form, the whole control. Very, very good, yeah. Really good, except for that crow hop, I agree. Sorry, so let me do the last one here. This is a 5231. Okay, this is a back one and one half somersault, half twist again. So they're gonna be starting in the back. They're gonna do one and a half rotations going in, but they're gonna be facing back towards the dive stand again. So this is, a, this is the last one I'm gonna show you. Okay, what you see, scores. Yep, yep. Pretty consistent scoring there, that's good. Yeah, yeah, she crow hop a bit there. Um, overall a clean dive, but she didn't quite go in. I don't think she really went in that vertical. As a matter of fact, when she came off, here's the other thing. She doesn't, she's just getting off the board. That's one of them really close calls, you know? You know, is she just off the board? She's already starting to turn her shoulders a little bit. So she's doing it right here, and that's all well and good. But then she comes in. But now look. Look where the contact with, is. with the. She's contacted the water right there. So where is the body? Absolutely not in the right, <laughs> right? She's, she's hit that water and she's, she's kind of not straightened up very well. Y'all agree with that? Is it deficient? 
Um, well, I mean, you, you have to, again, you have to consider everything that's in there. There's a lot of the elements that were good, but it's her entry that I thought was the, the failing part here. So yeah, um, I, I don't know that I would call it deficient, but again, you as a judge, if you don't like what you see, if you think the overall quality of that dive hits in the deficient range, then absolutely call it that. Um, I don't know that I would completely go there. I would probably say, you know, let's just, you know, four and a half, five is probably what I'd give her somewhere in there. Because I like to see a clean entry and I like to see more height. So. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a low unsatisfactory. I'm not sure it's just completely deficient. Yeah. So, you know, you can, you, you, you make the argument either way, but yeah, just, it needs to be a lot cleaner than it was. All right, folks, that's all I got for the night. Hopefully that worked for everyone. Thank you. Steve, thanks so much. Dave, Thank thanks you. so much. Thank you, everybody. And good luck Sunday. Yeah, I,